All right, guys, I'm really glad that you were able to join me today after school. I really, really appreciate it. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about, again, is some of the stuff that you're already doing, but how we can kind of create this blended marriage and this blended relationship between the English department and the social studies department and truly teach English in really both content, all, both content areas with a humanities approach. So our focus today, how can we utilize a humanities approach to help provide a better context for our learners? And so what I'm asking you to do today is simply think about the possibilities. And if it, even if this is something that's going to be hard to implement right now, maybe we can do it next term or uh, maybe next school year. But thinking about how we can kind of team together and contextualize this information for our students. Now, a few key ways to integrate history into your classrooms currently, and some of you guys are already doing this. I know uh, Sade has come to me a couple of times and told me some of the stuff that she's doing. Uh, you can do it explicitly. And I know that some of the kids wrote, they, they read The Crucible, right? And so explicitly integrating U.S. history or history in general would be teaching about the Salem witch trials in 1492, mm -hmm. right? But you could also do it thematically and allegorically. And I know this is something that Charday had mentioned that she did with her kids, and that's looking at McCarthyism, right? You, using the, the Crucible to analyze the cause and effect of McCarthyism here during the Cold War, right? Uh, how would the McCarthyism apply to the crucible? Do you guys have any idea how that would work? The frenzy, the witch hunt. Yeah, the frenzy and the witch hunt. Mm -hmm. How else could we apply that? What do you guys know about Arthur Miller? He married, was married to Marilyn Monroe. He was an he, author. Was, that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm -hmm. In, in 1956, he was actually interviewed by the House of Un-American uh, Activities Committee, HUAC, and uh, they asked him to turn over the names of communists, right? And mind you, he had created the Crucible in 1953, but he was one of the people that was accused of being a communist. He was part of this witch hunt, and so that's what gave his work so much more value, and also even prior to his creation of, of the Crucible, it was really the purpose for his work. So yeah, it's about the Salem witch trials, but it's about so much more than that. And so do you guys understand how you can teach the Salem witch trials or teach the crucible, and at the same time, have kids think about things such as spies and you know the, the arms race and all of that good stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now things that you're already doing, uh, I'm assuming you're doing, how many guys uh, have your kids analyze visual images? Great, great. Mm -hmm. that, and it's simple, you know, what do you notice? What, what are they saying? What message are they conveying? Cartoons. We do Political cartoons, cartoons mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And obviously you guys do textual analysis. I put diddles there as an example, just because that's a tool I thought was really helpful when I was teaching AP English language, especially in identifying tone. So these are things that you're already doing. And in doing this, all you would need to do really, if you want to include the humanities approach is include some stuff from history, right? Now, from what I understand, some of the kids are reading Huckleberry Finn, correct? Yes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run through some examples. Uh, how, how can we use Huckleberry Finn to teach about stereotypes? We can talk about the way um, the African American. Uh, image was presented during this time okay. uh, this is written of course written before uh this is written in the 1920s 20s but it is based upon the civil war period or okay. pre-civil war so we can uh, teach them about how stereotypes have transcended through history okay so how they transcended through history very good anyone have any other thoughts how they were um, portrayed as being silly, very obedient, um, mm -hmm. just childlike, mm -hmm. you know, through the book. Yeah. And I almost wonder too, how is that a reflection of history? So if this is talking about, you know, uh, how historically African Americans are portrayed, would that portrayal, even though they're talking about a different time period, would that portrayal be true in 1920? Would that same portrayal also be true in 1960? And is that portrayal true in 2015? Well, it was probably never true. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it was 
what the power structure at the time wanted to portray mm -hmm. or wanted to make themselves believe. Right. Because Langston Hughes wasn't silly and goofy and he didn't he wasn't a minstrel man. Mm -hmm. So So maybe you can ask the kids where do these ideas come from? And why? And why have they persisted for so long over so many years, right? Because if we know Langston Hughes didn't fit that description, if we know Barack Obama doesn't fit that description, Huey P. Newton doesn't fit that description, these are all people that you can include in your lessons and have them think about over time, how, how have these stereotypes evolved, if at all, and why do they persist even though we have so many people that don't fall into that bucket? Now, what I wanted to show you guys, particularly, is this idea of the evolution of stereotypes. All right? Is, is anyone familiar with this political cartoon? I am. So what we have here is a black person and then a white person. Now, here at the top, I don't know if you can tell, but here it says south. And at the top of here, it says the north. So we have this scale. And what are we learning about this from this scale and this portrayal? that um, one image or the white male weighs more in society than the black male. Well, what makes you think it weighs more? Well, one, based on the imagery, I'm looking at it to see that the scale, of course, is not uh, equal, but because of how for so long blacks were treated as property or as animals, they did not have the same rights uh, that's what I'm taking from it. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Because what if I submit to you that, because I think black and white, they're such, especially when we're talking about social justice, they're such power words that I'm willing to bet that Sade saw a scale and she thought black and white, and that's, that's what she went with, right? Let's look at the faces. What are we noticing about the faces? The one on the right looks and he almost he looks, looks like a... Does he look human? No, he looks like a monkey. Yeah. And the other, like a pickaninny, the lips are large and so blown they're up. About, uh, I want to go back. You said they look about equal. Yeah, so I want to go back to what you Similar. said about them yeah. being equal. And if we're analyzing and saying, okay, this is a human mm -hmm. and this is not a human, then perhaps the subversive message that's being sent is you know, that black people or a black man or person mm -hmm. is worth just as much or is equal to a monkey, a dog, a cat, a chair. So what does this white stand for? What, how, how would this represent white people? Can you guys think of a time in which a group of white people were seen as equal to or almost equal to black? No. Holocaust? No. Here in America. Uh, in America. No. In America. And so this would be the power of us teaming up with the social studies department, mm -hmm. right? Because this is something you could analyze with your kids, because I guarantee you a lot of kids don't know this. So this white side is supposed to represent the Irish American. Uh -huh. ah. And how they were viewed in the North compared to how blacks are viewed in the South. All right, this idea that these, these two parts are equal, even though they have, you know, different color skin, and they may have different struggles. In a lot of ways, their struggles are very similar. Right? And at the, yeah, but then at the end of the day, the Irish soon lost their accent, and they were still white. Exactly. And so that's the power of the evolution of stereotypes. How many people stereotype the Irish this way today? Not very many. Not very many, right? But would you guys say that black people still have a lot of those old negative stereotypes? Yes. yes. And so that's something that you could discuss with your kids. And in discussing that, what, what historical eras could you hit in your classroom? Evolution Things that you're stereotypes? passionate about. Yeah, evolution of stereotypes. Oh, I know what one. Is, like, okay, so like in my class, we did, um, I don't know if this is applicable, but we analyzed how women have been portrayed throughout history. So we looked at Phenomenal Woman by Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. historical context too. Right. And then we looked at, we compared it to women of today, like your Nicki Minaj or, you know, so on and so forth. We and looked at um, the over-sexualization of women in hip hop, mm -hmm. looked at those videos, all of that stuff to see how women have been portrayed and how those stereotypes about 
black women in particular have right. evolved. Right. That, that's, that's perfect. And you could even throw in there, it, it, just from a humanity perspective, I would even throw in there you know, the struggle for women's suffrage, and the, the struggle for women to have political equality, to have a political voice. Uh, maybe even some of the flapper stuff of the 1920s. They're kind of liberating themselves. Yeah. Right? Uh, were you going to say anything, Mitri? Um, goodness, I, I was just thinking of the Jim Crow laws, mm -hmm. um, personal examples when my father, you know, United States Air Force, we travel across the country back and forth. He was six foot two, police officer, dignified man, but whenever we came through the South, we'd either sleep in the big Cadillac, 62 Caddy with fins, um, in one of the sleep areas. Uh -huh. You know, our dad was there, we were safe. Right. And he had his, you know, he was a police officer with the Air Force, had his gun. Um, but it was interesting, every now and then, even he needed to find a hotel or a motel to sleep in a bed. The highway thing wasn't gonna work. And I remember watching my mother, my white mother, my father's black, walk into the hotel, after my dad was denied a room, she'd go in a few minutes later and get a room. And we'd drive to the back of the hotel and we'd sneak up the back stairs like you sneak a dog into a hotel today so you know stuff like that powerful yeah yeah I, I whenever i think about huck finn in particular because kids i mean especially you know our our 10th and our 11th graders they know stereotyping happens right uh, they've been stereotyped before most of them know what a stereotype is of some sort right mm -hmm. and so how can we really drive it home for them and really kind of raise uh, i hate the word rigor because it's so like you use it so much that it kind of loses its value, but how can we make it more rigorous? How can we make this more challenging and have them really kind of analyze these real world issues? And I think looking at the evolution of these stereotypes is the way to go, whether that's through Jim Crow mm -hmm. uh, or maybe the, the, the civil rights movement. Through their own cafeteria. Or, or, yeah, or their, or their cafeteria. Right. The struggle for uh, you know women's liberation and equality, the over-sexualization. Whatever the case is, I guarantee you what you guys do, as long as you're providing uh, this kind of real world context and if you're teaming up with a social studies teacher, there's curriculum for it. I guarantee you that somewhere that, you know, we can join forces and make, make, it, make this whole thing overlap. Are there any questions about that? Yeah. I want to throw in another image here. Uh, in my class right now, we're covering the Holocaust. And so this is another image that could be analyzed. Uh, this is about, uh, well, the title is The Eternal Jew. Right? And uh, this is put out by Germany. And so what are, what's the purpose of having this image called the eternal Jew? What are they trying to convey with this image? Again, put out by Germany. It's a German. Yes. Is it a mouth? What is it? Is it's, a, it's a thing. A thing. Yeah. It looks sinister. Very. Sinister? What makes it look sinister? His eyes. Um, they're narrow. Yeah. And the image looks a lot like the propaganda, uh, propaganda pictures I've seen before yeah. that were used uh, by Hitler at the time. Right. That's exactly what it is. Right. It's, it's you know, the, the stereotypes. Now, it's okay, basically no. a caricature mm -hmm. of, of Jewish people that's used for propaganda. And we'll, we all know what happened during World War II. And that, and that was the Holocaust, mm -hmm. right? And so one thing that you can analyze with your kids when you're looking at something like Huck Finn, well, what's the impact of stereotyping? How have we seen stereotyping impact different groups throughout the world, right? In some cases, it promotes genocide, right? And that's very blatant genocide. In other cases, it may promote, promote genocide that's probably a little bit more subtle or prejudice that's a little bit more subtle in other parts of the world or you know, here in the United States. 